ಯೋಗೀನ ಚಿತ್ತ ಪದೇನ ವಾಚಾ ಮಲಂ ಶರೀರ ವೈದ್ಯಕೇನ ಯೋಪಾಕರೋತ್ತ ಪ್ರವರ ಮುನೀನ ಪಾತಂಜಲಿ ಪ್ರಾಂಜಲಿರಾನ ತೋಸ್ಮಿ So in the last class we were studying from the 17th sutra onwards and we covered quite a number of succeeding sutras where we found that the yoga sutra is trying to establish the idea that there is a conscious principle behind the mind the mind itself can never be self conscious we have to take something beyond the mind as in the western philosophy we find that the soul is equated with the mind as the founder of the western philosophy in the words of descartes it's that we think therefore we are so that statement itself shows that we are equating that as if the soul is being equated with the mind but we find in this yoga school in the vedanta school they propound that mind is also the part of prakriti of nature it itself it is by itself is inert unless and until it comes in association with the conscious principle which is apart from the mind so today we will again continue with those sutras with the idea to find out you know when the investigations are going on when there is an investigation of some crime then based on some clues at last you just go to the prime suspect so you are yet to get the prime suspect but with the help of the clues you go and at last when you reach you think that you have almost got hold of the prime suspect when you find that your investigation was correct but the prime suspect is absconding you know who he is but he is absconding so we will find almost similar thing here the yoga the vedanta school the yoga school will find out with the various clues with the various footprints uh of the sin on the seer the when this the seer is seeing through the various sequences of the things which are sin the footprints are left behind but following the footprints when you try to catch him you find it's he's beyond our reach so that's the way we will try to understand uh the seer and the relation of the seer and the sin how the seer keeps its footprint on the sin uh but it can never be sin because if you see it it also becomes sin so you have to go still farther behind to find out the seer and that will lead to the defect called ad infinitum so first let us uh just go to that assumptions the various inferences which the yoga school will be resorting to as a clue to find out that sir there is something consciousness as the fundamental as the fundamental principle there is something called consciousness the purusha which when gets associated with the nature prakriti the perception happens so let us try to understand the first thesis we can say which the yoga school in this respect is placing before us is we find it in the 17th sutra of the fourth chapter what is the thesis that you see in this world what that if we have to perceive any object that object can be in two state either it is moving or it is stationary now whether it is moving or whether it is stationary to observe it i have to have a reference point referral point which is comparatively stationary to that point just to give an example many things are moving but we are not aware of it 
The earth is rotating on its axis at a tremendous speed. Do we realize it? No, because we also are revolving along with the earth in the same speed. So the referral point is at the same speed with the, thing, with the object. So we feel we are stationary. So the first condition of observing an object, either stationary or motion, is the referral point should be stationary. If compared to that, in reference to that, the other object appears to be stationary, then I say it is stationary. If reference to that, if it is moving, then I say that object is moving. So the reference point should be relatively stationary. So this we all understand, it's a very common thing. So based on that, the first uh, thesis, which the Yoga Sutra will be propounding is in the 17th Sutra. What's that? Sada Gyata Chitta Vrittaya Tat Prabho Purushasya A Parinamitvat. The Purusha, we take it as a proposition at beginning. It's a proposition. We are just inferring. I cannot show it to you. We are inferring. Why we are inferring? That in this world you see that unless you have a stationary referral point, you can never under you can never detect the motion. To understand that something is moving, there should be a stationary referral point. So now, first come to the eyes. With the eyes, we are seeing everything. So in the external world, if anything is moving, my eye has to be stationary first. My eye is stationary, the thing by with which I am seeing. First, let me take the eye to be the drashta, the seer. The eye is seeing, the objects are moving. So what's that? What is the aparinami? The eyes are aparinami. It's unmoving. But is it really unmoving? No. Because when the objects are moving, my eye as such is not moving. But behind the eye, in the retina, the images are moving. The eye is as such as the eye as a unit is fixed, but the images that are forming on the retina that are moving. Who is perceiving that? The mind. Now, when the mind is perceiving, it has to be focused on the object you see. You, sometimes it may so happen that when you are distracted, then your perception is not possible. Though I am hearing something, if I'm looking at something very intently, I'm watching the TV, someone calls, I don't hear. So to hear, my mind should be focused there. So now here also to see something, my eyes should be focused there. If I'm distracted, something may happen in my presence. That's the thing with the pickpockets, the thieves always do. So even if they are in your presence, they know how to distract you. In your presence, the thing will happen, but because of the distraction, your eye somehow is not getting connected to the mind. So here in the second, first, the eye I considered is unmoving, the objects are moving. And with that unmoving eye, I saw. But actually though the eye is unmoving, but the pictures in the retina, which there's falling, that is moving. That has to be observed by the focused mind, which again is unmoving. So mind as a unit is unmoving, it is focused. But if you really observe the mind, what is happening? If you even scan, you will find there are various that, what you say that as if uh, that this, this, what is there's this firing is going, firing of the neurons are going on. Various firing of the neurons are going on. That speaks of the vrittis, mental formations. These vrittis are formed, various, even the, uh, what we can say as the neural firings, we can say it in the yoga language as the vrittis. All these vrittis, so that is constantly changing. Now, unless someone is observing that, how can I understand that, that the things are changing? Because we always found to find, to just observe any motion, you have to have a referral point, which is stationary. So this is the thesis which the Yoga Sutra at the beginning brings. That as the mind is constantly moving, the vrittis are moving. And I know when I, that what I am seeing, if I see a train is moving, 
it's not only my mind perceives a moving train i know that the train is moving that someone is there who is perceiving who is beyond the vrittis of the mind to perceive that so that's why yoga sutra says that the one who is the ultimate perceiver of the vrittis of the mind of all those neural firings the one who is observing it's a very important thing now it is the scan machine is there when you are thinking suppose a scan machine is fixed in your head it's a very wonderful thing we if you just think it a little you will find how wonderfully this sense of i works now i can say that with this uh, development of the uh, science whether you are mind is still or you are thinking something with the fmri i can find out but what can you find out you can find out only the neural firings you can never find out what i am thinking for that a subjective experience is needed from outside if i scan i will find only the neural firings but it is only me in whose brain that neural firing is going on some observer from within subjectively has to be there to observe it to really the perception to happen so that's the thing as a thesis that's comparatively aparinami some unchanging entity has to be thought of now as an antithesis what's the first antithesis they say why we have to consider someone as observing the mind if we say that the mind is self luminous it is by itself have the capacity to uh, create that idea that i am seen it is self luminous why there is a need to think something behind the mind as which is the conscious principle which is luminous because of which the mind all the observations of the mind which is going on all the mental formations which are going on i perceive what's the need so why not take the mind itself to be self luminous so that's the first antithesis so the thesis is it cannot be so now yoga sutra will propound that it cannot be and for that it will give two reasons the 18th sutra and the 19th sutra are the two reasons the first reason is natat swabhasham drishyatvat it cannot be self luminous because it is seen so as we were seeing that in yoga in vedanta the idea that the entire universe is built in the same plan what you see in the microcosm the same plan you will find in the macrocosm so it's all I means to just give an example in the more, even in modern science this is the idea of uh, this idea is being uh, uh, in modern science they call it uh, exact time i'm forgetting immediately there is a particular time that to give an example the term i will most probably remember in short time suppose you see a huge cross ha huh. anthropomorphic the entire universe is anthropomorphic what does it mean suppose you see a huge cross and now you want to uh, just find out with what that cross is made so any if you have a digital picture it has to be made by dots so you go to find out the dots and you enlarge enlarge at last you find each and every dots by which the entire cross is made is also a cross again you enlarge that dot you enlarge enlarge and you find that dot again is made of small still smaller dots which are of the shape of cross so this is the idea in modern science this this anthropic principle that the universe the macrocosm and the microcosm is built in the same plan as in the last class also we were saying that just see that if you see the motion of an electron around the atom it's something going around the planets are moving around the sun you go to any in the universe you will find all the stars are sun and they have their own planets and not only that each planet have their own moons they are also doing the same thing this is just one example so you will find the same phenomenon the gravitation which acts here anywhere it acts in the universe so what you find in the microcosm the same thing you find in the macrocosm the universe is built in the same plan the microcosm and the macrocosm in the words of ramakrishna jaha ache bhande taha ache brahmande what you see in a small pot you can see the same thing in the entire ocean so that's the idea so here also you yoga this yoga and the vedanta 
philosophy will be using. So not that swabhasham drishyatva. If anything is seen, it cannot be self-luminous. When with my eyes I am seeing the object, the object is seen. So who is that one who is illuminating the eyes? But is the eye the ultimate uh, illuminator? No. It is also inert. The mind is illuminating it. So all the external world which we see is, is the sin, the eye is the seer. They go behind, the mind is the seer, then the eye, what the objects or the images formed in the retina is sin. Now all the vrittis, the mental formations, the neural firings which are happening in your mind, how can it see itself? That's the thing that we always find even if you take a camera, does the camera know it is taking picture? No. You cannot find in the universe anywhere the thing which you are using to get the picture by itself uh, can know that it is the uh, thing which is doing it. So it is an instrument. The moment you can see it, it's an instrument. So ultimately we have to consider and subject who is behind the mind, the fundamental principle, the fundamental conscious principle behind the mind, who is observing the mind itself as it is being seen, because I know the chitta vrittis, all the vrittis which are arising in my mind. If I am angry, I know I am angry. If I am sad, I know I am sad. If I am happy, I know I am happy. If I am seeing a flower, I know I am seeing the flower. So this self-reflective awareness, which makes me aware of my perceptions, feelings, mental formations, is the one who is the Swabhasham, who is the luminous one. It cannot be seen. If you see it, you have to think someone else behind it. So that's the first uh, reason which yoga is putting. Not that Swabhasham, Drishya. As this mind is seen, what is going on in the mind, I know. So it cannot be self-luminous. That's the first, first inference, first uh, thesis which yoga puts. The second is in the 19th. Eka samayecha ubhaya Anavadharanam. So there is a very technical discussion on it. We are not going into that. Simply we let us try to just take the literal meaning of the sutra and try to find out an easy way to understand. Eka samay, at single instant. Ubhaya avadharanam. Have you ever seen at the same instant the thing which is making you object aware is self aware? When with the eye, I am seeing the object. Am I, am really, is the eye aware by itself that it is seeing the object? No. It has, the mind has to be behind the eye to make me aware of my eye. To give a common example, we'll understand that as Swamiji is giving in one of his lectures, this example, that you may have the most beautiful eyes, but that doesn't until you can see the world. Just if the optic nerve is somehow mutilated, with the beautiful eyes, you see nothing. So behind the eyes, the my, this mind should be there to make you aware of the eyes. Not only that, if the optic nerve is disconnected, is not there, if the, somehow the eye, the beautiful eyes which you have is not connected with your brain, you can touch the eyeball, there won't be any reaction. You're not aware of your eye. That's what happens in the state of coma. That's the way the doctors, uh, finds out whether you are in a coma, state of coma or not. What? If you are not in coma, the mind is still attached to your eyeballs. So even if you are sleeping, you are not in coma, you are sleeping. If the eyeball you touch, immediately there will be a reaction. The reflex will be there. You will immediately you will find that the eyes are reacting. You forcefully close the eyes so that no one can touch the retina. But when you are in state of coma, if you touch the eyeball, no reaction. So what has happened? The eye by itself is not self-conscious. The mind has to be behind that to make us aware of our eye. So eye is just an instrument which is making us object aware, but it is not self-aware. For that self-awareness, so this both together can never stay. So to, me, to be aware of my eyeballs, these golakas, in yoga, in Vedanta, these are not called indriyas. Indriyas is in the mind. These are golakas. These are just the apparatus. So to be, uh, to be aware of this apparatus, there has to be the mind behind it. So the I, at the same time, cannot be object conscious and self-aware and self-conscious. Similarly, now, the same principle applies to the mind. 
if you say the mind is self conscious now my mind is aware of what is happening in the retina of my eyes so i am object aware now for the mind the eyeball is the object the retina of the eye is the object what is happening there it is aware of that is the same principle how the mind can be self aware at the same time it has to be someone behind that to make us aware of our mind so these are the two uh, reasons which yoga now brings uh, brings forth to uh, go against that idea that the mind itself is self luminous so now again we will find that they doesn't end the antithesis that there are some schools of buddhism who speaks of mind behind the mind that what is not exactly mind behind the mind that the mind has parts one part of the mind is cognizing the other is the cognizer one is the cognized other is the cognizer one is seeing one is seen so there to uh, what you say that uh, negate that thesis this antithesis that why not consider the cognizer mind behind the cognized mind another mind so the 20th sutra which we studied in the last class what is it is saying that it cannot be why chittantar drishye buddhi buddhe ati prasanga smriti shankaracha so if another cognizing mind is assumed that chittantar drishye chitta this chitta antara means be, apart from this there is another chitra who is seeing drishye chittantar drishye if another cognizing mind is assumed so as to conclude that the cognizing buddhi is illuminating the cognized cognizing buddhi is illuminating the cognized buddhi the cognizer mind is illuminating the cognized mind buddhi buddhe then it will result in two defects two anomalies what is ati prasanga that is ad infinitum ati prasanga ad infinitum why if you think of one mind which is observing this mind then again i have to think another mind which is observing this mind and it will go lead you to that infinity ad infinitum it never ends the other reason is something very very strong that is called smriti shankar confusion of memory if one mind is cognizing another mind what is the confusion of memory just think forget about the technicalities now now i am conducting the zoom class now to be sure that all are seeing that those who are attending this class they are seeing they, they are just i am visible and my voice is also audible so what i do as a monitor i keep another laptop here i keep another laptop here and in that i also join with a, a different uh, uh what do you say that with a different identity i join that to find out whether the sound the audio is audible and immediately what will i find that the moment if i there's the sound which is uh, if it is all going correct the sound comes out what i will find that i won't hear what i am speaking there will be an echo so there there will be tremendous echo it will be impossible for me to find out what i am speaking the same thing happens if this what this the ideas are wonderful smriti shankara confusion of memory when the memory of one mind is reflected in the memory of the other mind so now this is act, acting like a monitor so now there will be echo of this to memory and you find when you a thing you see and the, instead of memory coming out you find in your mind it's tremendous noise you're trying to recollect you cannot recollect and it will create a tremendous noise in your mind and it will make you mad so that is the idea of smriti shankar so there is a confusion of memory so one is ati prasanga another is shruti shankar to give any very simple example suppose in a room there are two mirrors and you are standing in between how many images will you see infinite so therefore a single thing there will be infinite memories and all will be coming out at a single time and you will be confused just the way we we get confused if we enter a room where all the walls are made of mirror there are so many movies you will find that one has entered and now in search of that person someone else enters and he gets confused that where who is the real person because there are so many reflections so that's the thing which happens with our memory this 
it will one memory will be reflecting the other that again will be reflected where so there will be infinite reflections of memory and that will confuse your memory so that's the idea which yoga sp speaks of a wonderful idea that this will lead to smriti shankara chittantara drishye buddhi buddhe ati prasanga smriti shankara so now again another antithesis that you say i understand that you say that the purusha or the consciousness is behind the mind so with so many reasons you are trying to establish that yes there is a conscious principle behind the mind the mind itself is cannot be self conscious but can you show it to me now show it to me if you say that so here the 21st sutra that it cannot be perceived as it is fundamental means this idea we will come to it first let us go to the sutra chitte aprati shankaraya tadakara pattau svabuddhi samvedana the purusha the chite sorry the not chitta chita chite there's a difference there's a little difference can make a lot of difference chitta is the mind and chita speaks of consciousness from sat chit ananda that chit is consciousness chitta the one who gets conscious because of that consciousness so here first word is chite the conscious principle the purusha apratisankramya that is the primary source of consciousness the other things get conscious because that consciousness gets reflected on it to give an example in the full moon night the earth appears to be illumined and now in source of that illumination i look up and find the moon and i think that the moon is the source of illumination but what's at the real fact the sun which is not visible is actually being reflected on the moon that again is re reflected on the earth so the moon itself is not luminous similarly the mind like the moon that's why in many vedic uh, mantras you will find mind has been equated with the moon just because of this analogy that mind like the moon is not luminous it is the reflection of the sun it is the light of the sun that illumines the moon which in turn illumines the earth so this so uh, so the sun is the ultimate source of illumination in this example here also chite is the ultimate source of illumination apratisankramya that that is uh, that cannot be it's not something which is transmitted it itself is the so aprati sankrama means that which cannot be transmitted sankramana you, you will those who are uh, aware of any of the indian languages sankramana means transmission that now the covid virus you know that it transmits from one body to the other from one person to the other that is called sankramana but there must be a source for who from which it originated that from where it started so that source is aprati sankramanya that that has that nothing has actually infected him it is the ultimate source so that's the meaning of the word aprati sankramanya that's ultimate source from where the entire transmission has happened the chite aprati sankram sankramaya so at as it is the ultimate source tadakara patto sabuddhi svabuddhi samvedana so the purusha being the primary consciousness that as it is the aprati sankramaya so when the mind takes the form of purusha tad akara patto the mind like the moon is take, is being reflected then it becomes conscious the mind by itself cannot be conscious so it is actually speaking the purusha it cannot be perceived because it is fundamental i can perceive the mind as luminous because it is being illuminated by the fundamental principle just in even in modern science we can just take the example that when we take the physical objects can we see light never you must know we see the light in the daytime when the uh, sun is there on the sky the entire sky appears to be illumined if you go to the moon you will see the sky is not illumined we see the sky illumined because of the atmosphere the sun rays falls on the atmosphere and the light gets scattered there and that that's how the light becomes visible if you go to the space where there is no atmosphere it's all dark the illumined objects like uh, what you say like your night bulb is glowing and the entire thing is dark that's what you will see there in the space 
You cannot see the illumined sky like something there. So it's uh, as we are on the earth's surface, sometimes we don't realize that light itself cannot be seen. We can know the presence of light when it falls on something and makes that that becomes illumined. So how we know the presence of light? By the illumined object. Light itself cannot be seen. How we become aware of gravitation? Can we see gravitation? No. By seeing a falling object, I become aware that there must be something called gravitation, which is pulling it down. So these are the fundamental principles, which itself cannot be seen or perceived, but its action on something else makes us aware of that. So if you say, I, am, I don't believe in consciousness, then we will say, then don't, don't believe in gravitation. You don't see it. Don't believe in the light because you cannot see as such the light. It's only when falls on another object, that object gets illumined and then I'm aware of light. You shouldn't be believing this magnetism. It's only when an iron filing is, is getting attracted by a magnet, then I know, only I know it is a magnet. If I keep an iron bar and a magnet just in front of you and say, just say, which is the magnet? You can never say. You have to have some iron to place it in front of both of them and see which one is attracting. So the moment it attracts, then you say, well, this is magnet. Can you see magnetism? Can you perceive? No. So the ultimate, the fundamental principle can never be seen because that is aprati-sankrama, that is the fundamental. So what I can see my mind, what is going on in my mind, I can see. So here again, this that's why Vedanta is saying that when you ask, that show me, that you are saying that behind the mind something is there, how can I show you? Just the way I cannot show you light, just the way I cannot show you gravitation, just the way I cannot show you the magnetic field without the help of iron filings, just the way I cannot show you gravitation without the help of falling objects, just the way I cannot see you or show you light without an object being illumined, the consciousness cannot be seen. So at last, so here we find that Yoga Sutra through inference, through clues, have reached a place where they have found out their main suspect, they have found out, but he's absconding. You cannot catch him. So he's gone. So if now the question is that, okay, now you speak of three real, the three things, the consciousness, actually two things, the nature and Prakriti and Purusha. But that nature also has two things. Within the nature, first comes the mind and then comes the external world. So this conscious principle is illuminating the mind, which in turn, after it gets illuminated, it perceives the external world. Now, there are certain school of Buddhism. You will find all these uh, sutras are actually contending the Buddhism, which, which say that there is no external world at all. It is called subjective idealism. That what is the need for thinking that the external world is there? Why? That the, in the mind, inside the mind, all the ideas are there already. The, what we see in the form of ideas, it is already there. When the mind, when the conscious principle uh, gets associated with the mind, now they get illuminated, they get projected. Just to give a common example, now the computer has made the thing simple. In your hard disk, everything is there, nothing is visible. The moment you connect the, 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 on the computer, the current passes through those hard disk and you start working on your this uh, with your keyboard, the things become visible. The things which are visible, are they some, uh, there's something outside? No, it is all inside. When I'm pressing the keyboard, it's just the suggestion. It is also a part of the system. It's not something from outside, which is going uh, uh, in, as input and illuminating the hard disk. Or the entire product is from the hard disk only. So now the school of subjective idealism, they say that there is nothing called this external world. It is only the mental projection. Whether we take consciousness behind the mind or we take the mind as self-luminous, it's after all the projection of the mind which appears as the universe. And then the question comes how we interact. So in the Buddhism, that school, they will say that we all are projecting in the same way. There is nothing called reality, it is consensus reality. We consent that is the flower red? I say, yes, it's red. You say it's red, all say it's red, so it is red. 
but actually there is nothing outside. So here again, the Vedanta will be saying, no, it is not possible. There are two unknown. The self is unknown, but that is. Similarly, the external world is, but that is really unknown. I can never know it. When I see the red flower, that redness is the projection of the mind, but it is projecting on some suggestion, which I can never know. That's why Vedanta at last says a very interesting thing. The ultimate consciousness is just easiness. Everything else are just attributes. It is I who am uh, attributing all those things. It is all projection of the mind. But at last I cannot deny the easiness. Here we find the difference between the yoga and the Vedanta. In Vedanta they say that easiness is the same easiness as which is which uh, the one you are feeling as self, which is not known, the self, that, that is also something is, I, am, I cannot know it, and the external world is also is, this two isness is, is a part of, is, is a, not part, is the non-dual consciousness. And yoga will say, this isness is prakriti, I cannot know it, but it is not the consciousness, it is prakriti. This unknown in association with the mind, then when this external world, this mind gets activated. Now this external world is just like pressing the keyboard. It comes and then the mind illumines. All the things comes out from the hardware itself. So yoga says, unless the external world, yes, I, I that they say that we agree that the external world as such is not known, but that doesn't mean it doesn't exist. It is there, but we can never know what it is. Because of it, the moment we have to see it, it is tainted by our mind. That example which we give again and again, the red flower, the redness, is the flower red? No. Even science will say you that all the, this, the wavelengths of light has no color as such. When all the wavelengths of light fall on the flower, all the wavelengths get absorbed, only a particular wavelength which we identify as red, that is reflected back. That falls on your retina. And its work stops there. The light doesn't enter your brain. Now it's getting converted into a particular vibration of optic nervous impulse. That is going to the so-called color perception center. It is not perceiving color. There, the color is actually projected from there. It comes out and envelops that so-called unknown object, which is, but what it is, I can never know, and gives me the sense, oh, it is red. All the perceptions, all the wonderful smells you have is that way. It's projection of the mind. The mind in the process of evolution, what it has done, that anything which is favorable for my existence, I've developed a liking for it. There is as such nothing called good smell, bad smell. The thing which I don't like is bad smell, which is going to harm me. My mind got programmed that way, gradually. Those are all bad smells. The tongue thinks that a decomposed food is always bad smell because that is something which you cannot eat. It is going to harm you. So a fresh food, we find why wow, it has a wonderful fragrance. So why it is the thing which is good for me that the brain has programmed. It is good. It is nice. Smell is nice. So all these are the projections of the mind. But does it prove that there is no external world? No, it is there, but it is it can never be no in essence. The moment I try to know it, it is a coloring of the mind that taints it. Means it is just like uh, when uh, in, in, the, in the crime scene, in a crime scene, just to find out that the real crime, what you find that the one who has been murdered, he has been extremely mutilated so that you may not find out who has been murdered. So here also, the mind has extremely mutilated the external world by its own way. So what it is there outside, we can never know. We can never know. It is not possible. So that's what it is saying, that if you say that, uh, that uh, whether the external world is, so Buddhist schools say it is not there. It is just a projection of mind. Here, Yoga Sutra is saying no. That both the things are required. Drashtri, Drishya, Uparaktam, Chittam Sarvartham. That why, how can I know everything? That Drashtri, the, the one who is a seer and the Drishya, both has to color the mind. They're colored by the seer and the same. 
then only the mind can understand everything. So if I say consciousness as A and the external world as B and the mind as C, this A and C as such are never known. What we know is the coloring of the consciousness, is the coloring of the mind. The mind, when it's try to find out fathom in the depth, the essence, whatever ideas we get of the self, that is actually coloring of the mind. That is not the real self. And again, what we see as the external world, that is also again the coloring of the mind. So that way, Vedanta is denying the idea of subjective idealism. So that no, the external world is, though we cannot know it, but it is there. So now the last thing is say that, okay, we also now agree that the consciousness is there, as you are saying, okay, we agree. But somehow we find the mind is the main player. Why should I have to get identified with the consciousness? Mind is the main player. It is using the consciousness to project the world. So if this mind is the master. Consciousness is just a thing which the mind is using to just the way to get energized. We take so many capsules. So the mind as a capsule is, has just taken the consciousness to project the world. So the real master is the mind. You say to go beyond the mind. What's necessary? It's just to be, to just control the mind. There my spiritual journey ends. Why have to go beyond the mind? To keep the mind placid, to enjoy the placidness. That's my aim. What's the need for going beyond the mind? So mind is the master. If he's a real master, know to get hold of it. And then, then you develop the control over it. There the spiritual journey ends. So here the last thing, again through another inference. The yoga will be denying the fact. They will say, no, no, no. The conscious principle is the master. For it only, the mind is working. And for that, another inference it will bring. Wonderful. This, this, if you see the way the intellect worked for this for these rishis for thousands of years back is wonderful. What the sutra let us first read and then we will find that what they are saying to infer that the mind cannot be the master. It is just serving someone else. Why? Tat asam khaya vasanabhi chitram api parartham samhata karitvat samhatya karitvat that in the mind has so many innumerable subconscious impressions. Asamkhaya vasanabhi. It has. So it speaks of that mind is a something, a congregate. Now in this world, show me any congregate which serves its own purpose. To give an example, sometimes it becomes very difficult uh, uh, to understand if we just try to understand it abstract through abstract uh, uh, way of saying. With example, it becomes very easy. Now I'm sitting in the shrine here. We were conducting the class. And here, now just see the shrine room. What, uh, what is the shrine room? It is a congregate. It is made up of so many things. Uh, there's a wood, for the floor I find there's a cement. There are, uh, the tiles are there. For the roof, we find there's the timbers are there. The, there's woods, timbers, bricks. The walls are made of bricks. So, so many things. And not only that, even after the completion to keep it warm, the heating system is there. Electricity is there to illuminate the room. The sound system is there. Does the room, these are the things which constitutes the room. The room is made up of all these things. Is made up of brick, is made up of wood, is made up of uh, this uh, electricity, is made up of um, what all, all the ingredients you can say. The bricks, the wood, the cement, the mortar, uh, uh, the, the roof. All, does the room, this room serve any purpose for the brick, for the wood, for the sound system, for the computer? These are the constituents which makes this room. The room doesn't serve purpose for any of them. It serves the purpose of someone who is not a constituent, who is apart from it. Who is serving the purpose for me, for those who come to the shrine. They are not the constituent of this by which, by which this shrine is made. So now this another 
proposition the yoga is bringing. Show me in this universe that if anything is made up of various constituents, that aggregate serves the purpose of any of those constituents. It never, it always serves the purpose of something which is apart from it. Now, how can the mind be an a, a, the master, ultimate master? It is a conglomeration of so many vasanas or some care. There are so many innumerable mental modules which constitutes the mind. So it is a congregate. How can it serve the purpose of any of those aggregates, congregates of the mind? No, there has to be someone behind it. Who is the master for whom the mind is serving? So here we find a wonderful idea, Sanghata Parartatvat. So anything which is made up of constituents cannot be the ultimate. You have to go beyond that. So this reminds me of a wonderful conversation of Swami Vivekananda when he was delivering a lecture. Someone from the audience got terrified by the idea that the ultimate conscious principle has no parts. It is something non-dual. It is just the consciousness. And we are all it. And when we identify, we get identified with that, we lose our sense of identity. In the words of Ramakrishna, like a salt doll, trying to measure the depth of the ocean, just gets down and it gets melted. Who will give the news of the depth of the ocean? The moment you go, it becomes one with the ocean. So hearing this, one from the audience, one lady got up and just almost screamed, Swamiji, Swamiji, what happens to our individuality? And Swamiji being interrupted had a nice smile in his face. And what he replied was something wonderful. Told, Madam, you are not individuals yet. You become individual when you become one with that. It's a wonderful idea. Sometimes with the words will be confusing. Just you think what Swamiji is saying is very interesting. What's the word individual means? That which is not individual is individual. That which cannot be divided. We use the word individual in the wrong sense. If you just take your personality, there is so many splits there. Thousands of splits are there in it. Even your physical body has so many parts. Your mind has so many thoughts. There are so many components. And how can you say you are individual? Is that non-dual that conscious principle, the Purusha, that is the real individual. So you are not individuals yet. You become individual when you are one with it. So here also that idea that how can mind be the master? It is made up of so many constituents. Show me in this universe. Anywhere, any conglomerate serves the purpose of its constituents, nowhere. It always serves the purpose of something else. You go to the hospital, the doctors are there, the building, the doctors, they're all part of the hospital. But for whom they're serving the purpose? For the patient who is in no way part of the hospital. Go to the school, go to the university, with all the knowledge, the professor is a part of that university. But for whom they're serving the purpose? For the student who is not a part, he gets admitted, he comes. So something which is apart from that system, for that the entire system is made up of. So the mind is a system. How can it be the master? Someone for someone else should be behind that. So just see the wonderful way the reasoning. But this all leads to inference. At last we find, yes, with the clues we find something is beyond the mind and that is the master. He is the prime suspect, but he's absconding. You cannot get hold of him. So is it that he can be never be got hold of? So the next sutra will say, no, there is a way to get hold of him. So now here, when we say that the Prakriti is not the master, it is there to serve the purpose of the Purusha. So naturally the first question comes, what's the purpose it serves? For what the prakriti? If I am the perfect uh, that uh, conscious principle, why it was necessary for me to go through this wilderness? Why it was necessary for uh, to uh, consciousness to get identified with the mind to find itself as an insignificant part in this huge universe? Which itself is a projection of the mind. 
What was the need? Why this? So here we will, we will find that the Prakriti is there to serve the Purusha in two ways. First, it takes us to the Bhoga and then it will lead us to liberation, Apavarga. Bhoga, Apavarga. First, I take this creation to be real and it leads to enjoyment. And through enjoyment, at last, I find out, we are all bound to find out that somehow I have got caught up in this wilderness. It is because of ignorance I thought it to be real. And then the question of going back to the source comes, leading to liberation. And the Prakriti is actually helping us. It is, it is not only the binding force, it is also the liberating force. So we cannot say Prakriti is the villain. As Sri Ramakrishna used to say very nicely, sharp hoye kati, ojha hoye jhai. Means what? As a snake, I just bite and pour poison. And as a, as a one ojha, means the one who is there to, like an exorcist, means who will be like a priest, who has, who with the spell, spell of his mantra, can take out the poison from you. So he say, I am the snake as well as I am the priest who can uh, make you uh, get rid of the toxin. So both I am. So the nature is the one who is not the villain. Then you may say that why he has bound us. He has not bound us. Just Sri Ramakrishna gives a wonderful example to, under, to make us understand the role of Prakriti. That suppose somehow you got lost in a deep forest. You have got caught in the deep wilderness. The Prakriti in the wilderness of the Prakriti. That is the ignorance. It's not that Prakriti has ensnared me. I somehow entered and I don't find the way out. And now in that forest, there are three dacoits. Sri Ramakrishna's story. That how the Prakriti means both makes us experience this world, binds us, Sometimes we feel we are just going to destroy us, but also there is a liberating factor within it. It also at last, through all the experiences it takes me, at last it takes me to upper work liberation. That story, with that story, that idea will become very, very tangently uh, uh, comprehensible. What's that story? Says so Sri Ramakrishna is saying that a man entered into the wilderness, lost his way, and suddenly he found he is caught by three dacoits. They come, they loot him. They take away everything. After taking away, one of the, uh, this, uh, what they say? That one of them says, let us kill him. After all, what's the use of keeping him alive? He, the, the, whatever wealth he had, we have got, now let us kill him. The another dacoit says, no, 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 why is to just to kill him? That you are thinking that most probably he may go back and just report it to the police and that way there will be a search for us. So you are asking to kill him. So, but there is, is a way out. Instead of killing, we can do another thing. Uh, what we can let us tie him that you see the stump. There's a stump of tree. Let him tie him nicely on that stump and leave him. He cannot go back. So the three agrees. They tie him in the, around the stump nicely. And the three dacoits leave. The man is helplessly just waiting there for death, most probably. Now, after some time, the third dacoit comes back. And he's a bit compassionate. He asks, oh, most probably it has hurt you. They have tied you so tightly. Most probably it has hurt you. Uh, you are feeling a bit suffocated. Let me remove Let me remove the, this, the rope. He, he unties the rope. And then he says that it is impossible for you to go out of the forest in this in this. Uh, will, in this, uh, this wilderness, you will just get lost. You don't, you won't, you cannot find out the way. Let me show you the way out of it. So this third dacoit takes him almost to the edge of the forest from where the village can be seen far off. And the man is elated. Oh, at last I found my, uh, this village. And now, just out of gratitude, this person asks the third dacoit, why not you accompany me? Please come to my house. I want to be the host. I want to be your host. Will you be my guest today? So just stay one night with me. And then this third dacoit says, no. 
points the village. That's the village. I have now taken you out of this wilderness. You please proceed. I cannot go. The police is there. They will catch me. So after this, saying this story, Ramakrishna is saying a wonderful thing. The one who said kill him is Thomas. Thomas destroys. The one who says bind him, tie him, he is the Rajas. Rajas binds us. And Sattva, he is also a part of this nature. It shows us the way out. Now what's the thing? Tamas kills us. What happens? First comes the binding. Once we enter into this wilderness, the wilderness starts attracting us. Its fruits. What are the fruits? Putraishana, Vittaishana, Yashaishana. In the form of progeny, in the form of wealth, I want to sustain myself. I want to pro just have my progeny so that this uh, lineage is continued. I want name and fame. So these are the Ashanas. It starts binding me. And once you get bound by these Ashanas, this uh, Rajas, this speaks of the Rajas. Why it is Rajas? This, this does the desires which make you, which makes you act. Rajas speaks of activity. Once you have the Putraishana, Vittaishana, Yashaishana, you have to be active. That's from that the ambition comes. You have to be active. That speaks of Rajas, which ultimately binds us. How? By forming that, that Rajas that gets converted into compulsion. Out of necessity, that, I said, that example we give again and again. What we do out of necessity, it becomes compulsion. It creates from a groove in the, my mind. And now I get compelled by them. As if I have no force to decide. I start overdoing them. And it, instead of sustaining me, becomes the destruction, factor of my destruction. The sweet which I like is actually the in the nature out of necessity I was in search of sweet fruits because that sustained me. And from that I developed so much liking for sweetness that it has become the main cause of lifestyle disease. It is destroying me. So the one, the same that Rajas is finding expression as Tamas. The Tamas is the one which destroys. Rajas binds. That activity binds. And that activity get converts into compulsion. It destroys. Sattva shows the way. What's that? That new pragya vritti. In your mind you have designed vritti. Constantly you are contemplating either on God or on the idea I am not this body. I am not this mind. I am the Atman. I am the conscious principle. Or even if you are a devotee, what you are thinking? That I am as, as it is limited being? That's not my identity. I am eternal as the soul. God is the eternal soul. It is the spirit which is worshipping the spirit. So that way you are negating your limited existence. And you are contemplating on that. That is creating a groove. This groove, this is also a part of the mind. But this is the thing which is showing you the way out. Sattva. This is the third one. This is showing the way out. When you can see the village, your destination, the sattva cannot take you because it is also a part of the mind. It has to leave you there. And now you become identified. You have found out. It can take you there. And that's the thing which will be spoken of in the 24th Sutra. That now it was only inference. That there are two types of knowledge. One is samanya. That is inference. Sri Ramakrishna used to give a nice example. That all this spiritual discussion is like, is just hearing the noise in the marketplace from a distance. From a distance, the, it appears to me that there is a huge noise there. But as I go near, then I find that, that, that it is actually not noise. There is some distinct uh, language is being spoken there. That most probably they are just, uh, what you say, this bargaining some are calling out the prize, others are bargaining, and you hear them now distinctly. But from a distance, it was a noise. So all these inferences are just like noise. It's very indistinct. But there is a way out. Once the sattva shows you the way out, then comes vishishta jnana. Samanya again is the ordinary knowledge which comes to inference, but there is a way for vishishta jnana. After inferring, it motivates us so that we go through that practice to that vishishta jnana. It's not that it cannot be 
uh, realized. It can be realized, though you cannot speak of it, but you can realize it. As in the word of Ramakrishna, kamon ghi na jamon ghi. Just the way you can never explain the taste of clarified butter. What to speak of clarified butter? I cannot explain the taste of anything unless the other person have tasted it. Can I explain the taste of mango to a person who have not tasted the mango ever? So it, this ultimate purusha can be realized, but it cannot be explained. Because to whom you will be explaining, he have not realized. How can you explain? So it can be realized. And that is the vishishta darshan. How it is possible that after this, all this, you may say, well, after it is only an inference. But it, it's very disheartening. That after all, what yoga is saying is it's only through inference, it can make me give an idea that there must be something conscious principle, but it cannot be realized. So now yoga sutra says, no. After it is just all these inferences are just to content someone who is denying the fact that is Purusha. But that doesn't mean it cannot be realized. It can be realized. So the next sutra will speak of the realization. We will just read the sutra and leave it here. We will continue again from it, uh, with this sutra in the next class. Vishesha Darshina. That the realized Purusha, for him what happens? Atma Bhava Bhavana Nivritti. When you have realized at present, what I am, when I am saying, I am the Atman. Who is saying? It is the mind who is saying. So it is also a thought. Atma Bhava Bhavana. It is also a thought. But when you have that realization, this thought falls of nivritti. That realization makes you, that Sri Ramakrishna gives a very nice example that how long we go on just describing the thing as long as you are not full with the realization. And a nice, very, very simple example he's giving. Just take a pot, immerse it in water. And as long as it is filling, it makes a noise. In Bengali, in colloquial language, he's saying bhok, 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 means it's making a noise. Once it's full, there is no noise. So this is a simple example, but it speaks a lot. Visesha Darshina. He goes beyond all these descriptions. He has realized all this language falls short. As long as you have not tested the mango, you have heard about the test of mango, you can go on writing books on the test of mango. But the day you test the mango, you yourself will burn all those books. You'll find all nonsense. What I have written is just mere imagination. It has nothing to do with the realization. So that's being spoken of. Atma bhava bhavana. The mind, in mind what all I were thinking. That ceases. When that vishesha darshana happens. How it happens it will speak again in the next few sutras. In 33 sutras this chapter will be over. Just a few more sutras is, are there. And we will be concluding the study of the yoga sutra. But you will see the wonderful intellect of these rishis with the intellect they infer with strong reason the presence of the atman and then they speak of its realization it's not that it cannot be realized so what this sutra is speaking we will have to elaborate it a bit more to understand it in its true sense and then we will go to the succeeding sutras also uh, which we will do it again in the next class with this we stop our discussion today thank you all namaskars